Started. Uh, today I have the, the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing my colleague Alan Boss. Uh, Alan has the, the distinction of being now the second longest serving staff scientist at DTM, currently on the staff. How are you, sir? <laughs> Alan got his degrees in, in several parts of the world, uh, beginning at the University of South Florida for a bachelor's and then a PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara which I made you, I could ever leave. <laughs> uh, such a beautiful place. And a postdoc at NASA Ames on, out on the West Coast as well. And then we uh, managed to convince him to come to DTM in 1981, became a staff scientist here in 1983, uh, and has been here ever since. His, his record, I, I'll only read you some, some pieces of this. So he was a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the Meteoritic Society, and both AAAS societies, the American Academy, of Arts and Sciences of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. It would be nice if they chose different acronyms. That's a minor <laughs> planet named after him. Uh, uh, Alan Boss is the name of him. Or yeah, minor I'm planet. Oddly enough. A minor planet. I love it. It's not just an asteroid. It's a minor planet. <laughs> uh, so he has over 300 papers. He has 10 books. Uh, and the last one that's still in, in uh, progress here is called The Last Voyage of the Carnegie, which should be an interesting read. Most of his books, of course, are in astronomy, which is his field. And this is, uh, I think, more the history of the last uh, Adventures of our with <coughs> the Carnegie. Uh, I think I was looking at his, his CV, and I think he's been on every NASA committee that's ever been constituted. Uh, <laughs> so uh, he's he's done both uh, tremendous service to the scientific community in support of it, uh, but also into his theoretical studies, and, and even more recently, to become an uh, observational astronomer. So today, Alan's going to talk to us about the shocking story of the origin of the solar system. All yours, own. Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, all this. The things that Rick was talking about were only made possible by um, becoming a Carnegie staff member, which gives you the freedom to do whatever you want to do for your life. So I owe everything to, to uh, Andrew Carnegie for endowing us long ago and to George Weatherill for hiring me. So I have to, have to start off with thanking them from the very beginning. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, I'm going to be the speaker, but uh, the story could not have been accomplished without the help of various other folks. Sandy Kaiser in particular is still actively working with me on these sorts of projects. But we've also had a number of uh, postdocs, being with Prue Foster, and then Liz Myhill, and Sergey Podkoff, and Harry Vanhoff. They've also been heavily involved in these projects uh, for some time. So our story begins, actually, back in uh, 1973, with the uh, publication of this book here, uh, by Victor Safronoff, The Evolution of Protoplanetary Cloud and the Formation of the Earth and Planets. In 1973, George Wetherill, shown here in his DTM office, uh, after he became director in 1975. He, 1973, George was still at UCLA as a professor. And he read the book and he started using his orbital dynamics code to not just study the orbits of asteroids as they're impacting the Earth or Mars, but he began putting in the collisional dynamics that uh, Viktor Safronov talked about in, in this book and began studying the formation of the, the solar system. Because the, the Soviets had no computers, but the Americans did, and so uh, George could really do something that the Soviet does, uh, strong astrophysicists like Victor Safronov could not do. Uh, I was right uh, 100 miles up the road in uh, 101 at UC Santa Barbara at the time. I was a graduate student when the book came out, and so I was looking for a thesis project, and I read through the book and said, that's great, uh, looks like interesting stuff, but what really puzzled me was uh, the picture in the upper right, which shows you uh, the concept of uh, where Safonov's books began and where Weddell's calculations began with the basically the old Kant Laplace idea of a disk of gas and dust. Uh, presumably the, uh, the solar, solar system formed out of such of a uh, disk because we know the major planets in the solar system all orbit in nearly in a plane, all in the same direction. So the natural starting point was the Kant Laplace nebula. Uh, but no one had ever seen such an object. No one knew if that was, those were real, so it's purely a theoretical construct. So I came to DTM in 1981, and uh, instead of worrying about the details of planet formation like George was worrying on, I looked at that, those sorts of uh, diagrams and said, well, how do we actually manage to form a disk like that? So I spent my PhD years developing the first 3D hydrodynamics code and then putting in rate of transfer for the first time. When I came to DTM in 1981, I continued working on those problems and uh, actually published 1985, the first such calculation showing how you could form a disk around a single star the key thing is to have a rotating cloud, but have it rotate slow enough that it can form a single central object with a disk around it, 
as opposed to a more rapidly rotating cloud, which we'll mostly study for my thesis, which tends to produce a binary multiple star system. <coughs> so that made George happy. Uh, this actually shows a, a 3D view in the mid-plane. So this is not actually a disk seen edge on on the lower left, but it's actually looking down on a sort of a bar-shaped nebula, showing that even from the very beginning, it was clear that the nebula is not necessarily going to be a nice axisymmetric disk like you see in the upper right but could very well have some structure in the azimuthal direction as well. Okay, so that's 1985. We finally uh, actually started beginning real pictures of what protoplanetary disks look like when Hubble was launched. And these uh, images are from the NICMOS instrument on Hubble from the late 90s, showing a couple of young stars, or these are single stars, formed all in splendid isolation. And you can see a number of uh, dark bands in front of the star. Those are the protoplanetary disk seen edge on, and it looks dark because the dust grains inside, which are going to form the planets, are blocking the starlight. You can also see some white uh, areas above and below where the protostellar outflows are illuminating the edges of the infalling cloud. And so we, at this point, we had our first observational evidence of what a protoplanetary disk might look like, at least around a low mass, uh, region of low mass star formation like Taurus. Of course, we now, uh, with ALMA, have done some spectacular work on seeing what these disks might look, look like if you view them more closer to the face on. This is not actually an artist's conception. It's an actual real ALMA image of the HL Tau disk, which uh, shows an incredible amount of structure in it. And it's only roughly a million years old. And it's showing that what, uh, whatever is causing those gaps and rings probably is a fairly massive body, presumably a planet of some sort. And uh, the idea of forming those planets out of scales of 100 AU within a million years is something that's a thrown off conception of the solar nebula could never have accomplished. And it's still a very active area of research to understand how a uh, protoplanetary disk could form such large objects so quickly. Uh, but that's a whole other talk that I will not uh, delve into today. So at that point, we thought we kind of knew uh, you know, some ideas about how the solar system might have formed. But uh, regions like Taurus are regions where not that many stars form. Most stars actually form in regions like uh, giant molecular cloud complexes with large 100,000 stars perhaps forming at a time, or hundreds of thousands at least. Here's one example. This is just one small snippet of a rather large region of high mass star formation, the Carina Nebula, showing a number of uh, rather odd objects, sort of the propeller-like things you see in the, at the top right and uh, at the middle center are actually, uh, the propeller things are actually outflows, bipolar outflows with Herbie Carroll objects in them, similar to what you saw uh, hinted at in the HST images. So these are regions where stars are forming rapidly. And um, uh, images of the disks in which they form can be seen in this Karina snapshot of a montage showing that they tend to be a little bit uh, looking cometary because there's a lot of uh, uh, ionizing radiation nearby. The interactions from the massive stars is, are blowing the gases in the disk backwards away from where the most closest massive star is. But you can still see some, some darkish uh, edge onish disks, uh, which are more reminiscent of the HL Tau type, uh, or to the Titori type disks that we saw earlier on. So the point is that uh, we've got two very different venues for forming stars isolated single stars in the Taurus complex, for example, or massive stars, massive star forming complexes which form the bulk of stars. And one has to wonder. You know, which of those two locations uh, would be the likely place to form the solar system. Well, a strong clue came in 1969 when the Allende meteorite fell in northern New Mexico. This was just a couple months before Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon in July 20th, 1969, and began the return of Apollo samples, which would figure prominently in our story later on. Uh, Allende, you can see uh, from the snapshot, is a, it has turned out to be the, the oldest sample, the oldest rock we know of. Uh, it has these rather large whitish inclusions called refractory moon inclusions. You can't really see it too well, but they're, those are sort of centimeter size. They're also smaller, roundish chondrules, and they're all embedded in this fine grain, darkish matrix. So, uh, given that the uh, uh, number of cosmic chemistry labs were gearing up for uh, analyzing the Apollo samples when they would return, uh, the Yenby meteorite was a godsend because lots of laboratories began studying these things in great detail. And one of the first to really find some exciting results was uh, Typhoon Lee, uh, Dimitri Papanastasio, and Jerry Wasserberg. Typhoon Lee was actually a staff member here at DTM. He left shortly after I came to go back to become uh, a leader of, uh, of an institute in, tai in, in Taiwan. Uh, but their studies of uh, uh, refractory inclusions in Allende found for the first time really positive, confirmable evidence 
that when, at the time when that rock formed, or at least inclusions formed within it, that there had to have been a live aluminum 26. Uh, and that the plot in the upper right shows you that evidence, which shows that the, the decay product of aluminum 26 is magnesium, magnesium 26. And what that uh, three isotope plot is showing you with the, with the line is that the different mineral phases, which fractionate magnesium and aluminum differently, if you have uh, uh, the amount of daughter product scales with the amount of aluminum, implying that that, uh, that excess above the lower left-hand point is due to aluminum 26, which was decaying. So if you do the numbers, you can calculate out that there must have been roughly for every uh, aluminum 27 atom, which is the, uh, the common one, uh, there were 5 times 7 minus 5 uh, aluminum 26 uh, atoms as well, or isotopes, I should say. So that's a that's actually uh, not a very small number. That's a lot of aluminum 26. It can do a lot of heating in early planets. And uh, uh, the key thing is that uh, aluminum 26 has a half-life of less than a million years. And it has to be synthesized in something like a uh, supernova or an 8S and probably giant branch star. It has to come out of some stellar interior. And with such a short half-life, you have to synthesize it, get it somewhere across the interstellar medium into a star-forming cloud, be it a torus-type cloud or a giant molecular cloud complex cloud. Have that cloud collapse down, have solids start forming, and form those little uh, centimeter-sized refractory inclusions all within a little more than a million years, which is a pretty short time scale. So that led folks, in particular Al Cameron, uh, to hypothesize that uh, well, perhaps that supernova that perhaps uh, created that aluminum 26, uh, not only created it, but also the shock wave, which would carry the freshly synthesized short life radioactivity outward rapidly, maybe that shock wave actually hit a dense cloud core and triggered its collapse at the same time injecting material into it. So that's the, uh, this is where the shocking part of the story comes out, that maybe the formation of the solar system involved a shock wave that not only brought in the, the aluminum 26, but also brought in uh, or actually instigated the actual formation of the dense cloud core. Let me just back up one to show you that uh, not only is uh, Lumen 26 valuable for understanding how the solar system formed, but it's also incredibly important for dating events in the very earliest portion of the solar system. It's been calibrated against the lead-lead uh, absolute ages and showing, the, for example, in this slide, you can see the CAIs, which were the, uh, the ending ones that we referred to before, are, are the oldest uh, objects. Those are the ones that have the 4.568 Billion year old ages. And the chondrules, which are found in the same rocks, are just a, a few million years younger. And so these, uh, Lumen 26 gives us a, one important tool for understanding the first few million years of, of uh, evolution of solids in the solar nebula. Okay, so this is where uh, the field sat in 1977. Cameron and Truman suggested the supernova trigger, and it just sort of uh, sat there for some time. Uh, I, of course, was still continuing to do models of star formation, and the typical star formation model at the time was so-called so inside-out collapse that Frank Chu had talked about, a sort of a torus-type cloud where an isolated cloud is supported by magnetic fields, and magnetic fields slowly diffuse out, and the interior of the cloud begins collapsing down and begins this gradual and majestic collapse to form a protostar. And uh, I was th thinking about, well, you know, um, there's also this evidence for interactions in giant molecular cloud regions for shock waves and H2 regions. Uh, so I, I did a paper somewhat motivated by the you know, these stuff showing what would happen if you actually took a cloud and hit it with a shock wave. And uh, I showed, yeah, well, yeah, if you have the right sort of shock wave and right thermodynamics, you can indeed collapse the cloud down. I even put in back in this 1995 paper uh, some tracer particles, which are shown here. I uh, put in 64 tracer particles, as you know, it was running on the, uh, the VAC 750 over here, so I couldn't put too many tracer particles in. Uh, but I found that uh, the tracer particles seemed to go be injected into the central collapsing region, uh, denoted by the little hole on the right-hand side. And roughly half of them ended up inside where the protostar was going to form, and the other half wandered off in other directions, as you can see from the trajectories. And uh, so I said, well, yeah, this uh, supernova triggering looks like it might very well work. Uh, the right sort of shock can, can trigger a collapse, and you can even get injection. Problem solved. Okay, so there it's at. Uh, I talked about this stuff at places like the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Houston, and which is where Al Cameron would often hold sway. Uh, and so he, at that point, decided, yeah, maybe we should, he should finally do some work on his own hypothesis himself. So he had a uh, graduate student, uh, Harry Van who was a Finnish person, uh, doing his uh, getting his degree from the University of Ulu in Finland, but he was working with Al Cameron at CFA. And he got a hold of uh, 
without Cameron's help, uh, the original Willie Bentz smooth particle hydrodynamics code, which Al had because he was using that to do the first uh, giant impact calculations. And so they used the SPH code to study what would happen when a shock wave hit a, a dense cloud core. You can see in the upper left the shock wave particles coming down, about to spray the smack into a conglomeration of particles representing a dense cloud core. And you can see the, the particles uh, envelop the cloud core, and in the lower right there's a bit of a, a finger of high density material, which is indeed being compressed in the collapse. So that part of the collapse was verified. But they didn't get any particles injected, so that kind of falls, you know, whole, whole scenario falls, falls apart if you can't actually get injections as well. What's the point of the supernova shock wave without having the injection of the Lumen 26? So at that point, um, uh, Harry came to work with me as a postdoc, and uh, he followed up on some work the Proof Foster and I had already published, showing that uh, the injection can occur. We can do a very detailed two-dimensional calculation. So these are calculations with axial symmetry. The right hand. The, the left-hand border of each plot in this time sequence uh, is the rotation axis, so it's a symmetry axis, or such, I should say simply, it's not a rotation axis, it's a symmetry axis, so a two-dimensional calculation. And so this is showing you after the shock wave has already struck the cloud, and you can see the formation of what are called Rayleigh-Taylor fingers, when uh, fluids of different densities are, are accelerated into each other, the penetration can occur through so-called Rayleigh-Taylor fingers. And, uh, Proof Austin and I found this first, and then Harry Danilo came along and continued to use <coughs> Proof Austin's code, the so-called uh, Virginia Hydrodynamics 1 code that, that uh, Proof developed or with, with, uh, uh, under the tutelage of the uh, University of Virginia folks at Charlottesville, and uh, showed that uh, if you put in more and more grid points, in this case uh, nearly 1,000 by 3,000 grid, really table of the finger just became more and more distinct, and this looked very interesting as, as a very plausible physical mechanism for it having not only triggered collapse, but, uh, uh, but injection as well. Uh, but this is a code which is uh, defined to be a uniform grid spacing. So if you want to put more and more resolution in particular to try to follow what's happening to the collapsing protostar in the lower right, you really should go to a different sort of code. And so uh, Liz Myhill, Sergey Potoff, and I worked on using the, the flash adaptive mesh code, which is a code which allows you to put grid points exactly where you want them. So this shows you one of our early calculations, uh, again showing the same sort of plot as before with a uh, symmetry axis on the left-hand border, really Taylor finger is forming, and this code is smart enough through its adaptive mesh refinement to put in grid points where it needs them to resolve little shock fronts and uh, take them out where they're not needed so that you can calculate, this, calculate these, uh, these models as quickly as possible because even, all these, even these calculations, even in two dimensions, they, they can take several weeks to run on, a, on a, uh, what at the time was a modern computer. So uh, we, we basically show that that sort of process can work and study it in, in great and gory detail. And in particular, we showed exactly what sort of uh, shock speed you have to have in order to have simultaneous collapse and injection occur. This is a rather peculiar plot showing you what happens as one varies the shock speed along the bottom. And uh, the, uh, the left-hand side shows that as long as you have a speed above about five kilometers per second, you can actually get injection of the shockwave material into the cloud. If you hit it at slower than five kilometers per second, the shockwave material just kind of hits the cloud and bounces off. Nothing gets really, the other fingers don't form. So you have to be moving at least five kilometers per section, five kilometers per second in order to have this process occur. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, if you were traveling you know, like eight kilometers per second or, or faster, you're moving along so quickly and there's so much kinetic energy involved that the shock front that forms will be so hot uh, that it will be um, so-called uh, an adiabatic shock front which will actually shred the cloud apart. So if you hit it too hard, the really Taylor fingers will just obliterate the cloud and you'll get a, a mess of debris downstream, but you won't actually get a, a region to collapse in and on itself. So it's sort of a sweet spot between something like five kilometers per second and 70 or 75 kilometers per second where uh, you can get simultaneous injection and collapse. All right, so everything's fine. Problem solved. Well, let's now go back to some of the theoretical evidence. You know, do you really need to have Lumen 26 coming from a supernova? Lots of folks have pointed out, including Ed Young, who I uh, cite here, that you know, Lumen 26 is actually produced not only by core collapse supernova, but also by the previous stellar phase, Wolf Ray A star, which is a very massive star, it's 20, 30 solar masses go through a, a phase called Wolf Ray A phases, where Lumen 26 is also have, has been 
synthesized and is blown out in the Wolf Ray A star wind. And that stuff just comes out and pollutes the interstellar medium. And so one idea is that, well, maybe just uh, the, uh, the uh, Moon 26 came from stellar nucleosynthesis, but it wasn't particularly tied to one particular supernova that, it, that actually triggered collapse. It was just injected into the interstellar medium, and the cloud, pre-solar cloud just happened to get a good chunk of it, and off it went. So this is showing you um, some of the uh, estimates for the amount of Moon 26 mass that might be floating around in, in the galaxy based on young calculations. So that's, that's certainly a plausible uh, explanation for Moon 26. On the other hand, Wolf Ray stars, for example, do not produce some of the other short light reactivities that people have found evidence for, and Iron 60 is the one that I will address next because it turns out to be the one of most importance. So there's been a, a mixed story about the uh, a level of, moon, of uh, Iron 60 that was in the solar nebula from the very beginning. Some of the earliest work, uh, far, let me just motivate that by, by first showing you uh, some nucleosynthesis uh, calculations of core collapse supernova, some calculations by Tour et al. from 2010, for 25 uh, solar mass supernova, showing you the uh, abundances uh, formed of several different short light rate activities, uh, depending on how, how deep they are in the star. So this, uh, the left-hand side is right down the center of what's going to be left behind in either a black hole or a, or a neutron star. As you go farther out, you, uh, you get the um, different uh, shells producing different amounts of the short light radioactivity. So, so the red line, the blue 26, you can see there's a fair amount of that produced in the supernova. And, uh, but also the blue line sort of correlates with it to some extent. So wherever you should get a 26, you should also get the, uh, the blue line, which is the iron 60, and you even get something called titanium-44, which is, has an even shorter half-life than, than either of those two other um, reactivities. So that's the motivation that not only should you be looking for moon 26 if it's coming from a supernova, but you should also be looking for iron-60. So the iron-60 story begins, uh, I think, largely with this uh, uh, data from Tachibana et al. from 2006, uh, where they or, uh, looked at a number of ferromagnesium chondrules from the ordinary chondrite semarcona of Bushenpur and found evidence, uh, somewhat, somewhat sketchy, you can see the, the uh, data points don't necessarily uh, cluster that tightly around the, the isochrons, uh, but they come up with, uh, with evidence for uh, initial iron 60 over iron 56 as the reference uh, nuclei, something like 5 to 10 times 10 to the minus 7, so close to 10 to the minus 6, which uh, again is a fairly, fairly large amount of iron 60 to have. Uh, however, that's been disputed by several folks, in particular Tang and Dolphus, a couple of years later, looked at not individual samples uh, from, from ordinary chondrites, but just did whole rock analyses. They just ground the whole thing up to see what's there for a number of different uh, types of bodies, the chondrite parent body, the HED bodies, and the unicolorated ordinary chondrites. And they basically found that instead of the top line, which is sort of Tachibana, at all a uh, level of iron 60. Uh, uh, they found uh, evidence for a level, initial level, of something like uh, 100 times lower. And that's low enough that probably is uh, comparable to the amount that is out in the interstellar medium. Again, like lumen 26 is in the interstellar medium, and so you don't necessarily have to correlate that, that uh, short light radioactivity with a direct supernova trigger. However, other, other folks have continued to Try to understand uh, initial iron six ratios. Mishra and Gaswami, in particular, has been doing, continuing to do work on, in this case, on seven unequivocal ordinary chondrites, uh, chondrules. I mean, now he's just doing individual chondrules, not the whole rock, like uh, Tang and Dalfus did. And he still comes up uh, with values of pretty high, seven times ten to the minus seven. Uh, here's an even uh, more recent uh, paper published the same year by, by with uh, Mark Shalcidong. Uh, three more. Uh, and the cool buried ordinary chondrites, and again, two to eight times ten to the minus seven. So those are values that, uh, that seem to require uh, a fairly prompt nucleosynthesis, transport, and injection into the solar nebula. But you know they don't agree with the whole rock analysis. So what's going on here? Can you believe any of this? Well, I think Miriam Tellis has done a fantastic uh, service to us all. Uh, she reported on this uh, last year in her seminar. Uh, has this, this really nice paper published with, uh, with other colleagues who, uh, who have been working on this project for some time. And she points out that through using these rather fine-grained X-ray fluorescent maps in, in eight different unequilibrated ordinary chondrites, she points out that uh, apparently the, the nickel and the iron is, uh, has, is no longer in its original position from when it was formed around these chondrules and inside, their, uh, inside, inside the chondrule. It has apparently been undergoing, it has migrated not through lattice diffusion, which would be the right-hand side, which would not particularly uh, lower the isochron, 
but through grain boundary diffusion and fluid transport, in particular if there's been aqueous alteration on the parent body, or even when the, uh, the sample was on, on the Earth's uh, crust, uh, Earth's surface before it was recovered for falls. Uh, and those processes, uh, illustrated on the left-hand side, will tend to bring the isochron down and, 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 and lower your inferred value of initial iron 60. So if you grind up the whole rock, you're going to lose that. You're going to end up with the situation on the, on the left-hand side. If you do individual chondrules, you can still get a high value. Now, what the true initial value is, I think uh, even Marion will say, is, is not really quite clear. We don't know what it is, but we now, now know better why we have this disparity between uh, the whole rock analyses and individual chondrule. So I, I hope Miriam will solve that one for us. Is she, is she actually here today? Yeah. Not sure. Okay, I can't quite, quite see. So, yes, there you Yes, yeah, you're behind, behind Sandy. So thank you, Miriam. Uh, if I said something wrong, let me know. Do you have a new value yet? What's, do you have a ratio for me today or, or not? Uh, we have a... Um Okay. About a factor, a little bit less than a factor two uh, lower than what Tachibana's estimates. Were. Okay, so we're we're still in business. So you're saying uh, six times seven minus seven. That that will still means I don't have to stop giving my talk and, and <laughs> so that's good. All right. So um, how are there? Well, there's there are other sort library activities as well. Uh, Brilliant ten, for example, also has a short uh, short uh, short half life, only one point four million years. There's evidence for that that's been found. And there's this paper published just recently uh, by Banerjee et al. where they've done core collapse supernova calculations and they've uh, done again the nucleosynthesis calculations and they show that they can produce the requisite amount of beryllium 10. And if you want to try to come up with the right uh, abundances of not only beryllium 10 but a couple other uh, short life reactivities like calcium 41 and uh, palladium 107 basically have one million years between nucleosynthesis and locking it up inside the CAIs. And so that pretty much forces you back in the same straitjacket of you better do things quickly. You can't just blast this stuff in the interstellar medium and wait for a couple hundred million years for a cloud to form. You better do it promptly through the triggering and uh, collapse hypothesis. Okay, so uh, now let's look at some of the astrophysical evidence for what supernova remnants look like, at least for core collapse type supernova remnants. They're the ones of most interest. So, uh, can I take the call? Whoever's got the call? Uh, I, I uh, Harold, you? I silenced it. Is it important? Sure. No, it's not. Do we listen to it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Well. No, it's irritating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Harold. So, here's the, the Cassay supernova uh, round. This one is really young. It's only about 300 years old. So, it's just exploded and coming apart. And you can see uh, this gorgeous. Uh, multi-space telescope between Spitzer, Hubble, and Chandra. It's got evidence for many different uh, uh, newly formed uh, atoms and isotopes in there. And you can see it's pretty lumpy as well. And in fact, if you look at it with the, the recent new star um, uh, Explorer uh, uh, space telescope, uh, what's highlighted here is uh, the titanium-44, which I talked to you about before, which has a 60-year uh, half-life. That's in blue. So this stuff is, you know, this thing is only 300 years old and it's decaying every 60 years. So we're not going to see any of it at all. And, uh, but you also can see where, where the iron 60 is presumably associated with the red and silicon and magnesium. Presumably aluminum wraps is, is on those areas and the green. Uh, the key thing is that um, this thing is really lumpy. But it's not smooth. So if we are wanting to make a direct connection between the nucleosynthesis calculations deep within a 25 solar mass supernova and what gets kicked out and what gets a cloud, there's going to be a fair amount of ambiguity about how much gets shot in each direction. Because you can see here, if you, if, I look at, if you look at the contours in the original published paper, they're basically factors of four between the regions which are, say, bright blue or, or dark blue. So this stuff is coming up kind of lumpy. It's going to make it a little bit harder to say exactly what, uh, do, what uh, mixture we expect to find in solar system materials. Okay, now that's one uh, supernova remnant. Here is uh, another one, uh, the Cygnus Loop. This one's a bit older. This is more like 6,000 years old. It's expanded quite a bit more. It's seen with the Galax uh, satellite and, and UV. You're seeing both the hot gas and dust for this one. And uh, uh, 
So somewhere d deep in the center is, is the remnant, either a neutron star or a, or a black hole. But we're focusing on the, the ejected material. And uh, if you do a blow-up of one portion of Cygnus Loop, which is this gorgeous Hubble image in the bottom, uh, the background is the, is the Cygnus Loop, and the, the little box in the upper left is where the blow-up is, where, again, it looks like an artist's conception, but that is an actual Hubble image showing you a shock front as part of the Cygnus loop, which uh, the other ones are, are bent around and they have slowed down a bit by having hit intervening material, but this one in the, in the blow up box is still pretty pristine, it's still kind of wavy, uh, but using that you can sort of estimate how thick it should be, and it works out to be uh, uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 4 parsecs. This is a really thin little shock, you know, that's what shocks are supposed to be. And you can actually get now some astrophysical evidence for what sorts of shock fronts we should put into our calculations to see if we can trigger and inject simultaneously. So that's the real value of these things, is this calibrates the theoretical models with real astrophysical data. Here's another region where uh, another a supernova remnant, the W44, again a core collapse supernova remnant, and this is in a giant molecular cloud. This is some, these are some radio maps, and we're going to do a blow up on the region in the upper left, or center left. And uh, here's a blow up of that showing you the, the radio contours. And uh, again, you're seeing these rather thin shock fronts moving forward. And at this point, because it's in a giant molecular cloud complex, it's already run into pre existing gas and dust. And the shock front is basically a snow plow. It's therefore sweeping up material, getting thicker, and it's also slowing down just by conservation of momentum. You have a high velocity, low density gas which gets merged with low velocity, high density gas, you're going to end up with intermediate density, intermediate velocity gas moving forward in the snow plow. So this shows you that uh, at, after about five parsec from the center, the, the supernova shock wave, which starts off at uh, several uh, you know, 5,000 kilometers per second, has already slowed down to 20 to 30 kilometers per second. So that, that's again, we learned from before how thick the shock front might be. And here we're learning, well, shock speed should be on the order of 20 to 30 kilometers per second. Remember from the early calculations, we said we should be seeing, we should be somewhere between five and seventy kilometers per second. Well, that's where we want to be. That's astrophysically indicated as well as what we get from the models. Not only that, some other radio observations of this W44 supernova remnant are shown in this uh, illustration that they use to explain their observations, where the shock front, the, the black line, is impinging on pre-existing dense molecular cloud cores inside, which have a size of about uh, a bit less than a, quite a bit less than a parsec size, which is actually going to turn out to be the same size as the cloud cores I'm going to show you in a moment. And they are interpreted, the real observations are being interpreted as the shock wave hitting these cloud cores, compressing them, and then behind the shock wave there are dense clumps which are perhaps beginning to collapse to form protostars. So that's exactly the same sort of situation that we're trying to model theoretically. Okay, so as motivation then, uh, let me finally show you what this might uh, look like after the dust has settled as it were. Here's a, a Lens uh, 1251 cloud which is interpreted uh, as being a young T Tauri star, sort of like an area of isolated star formation. There, only, there aren't that many stars forming here. But this is one that's been interpreted as having been struck by a nearby supernova, which has long since swept past, and the compression of the supernova is thought to have triggered the uh, formation of the stars inside that cluster. So that, that might very well have been clustered like that uh, as, as, a, as a mental image of what the solar cloud might have looked like when it was uh, in the solar system when it was just in the process of being formed early on. Okay, so that's the, uh, the observational constraints and the, and the cosmic chemical constraints. Now let's get to the fun part, which is uh, Sandy Kaiser's movies. So here is some of the stuff we've done with the flash code, uh, where we've taken uh, the top is, is a very thin supernova shock wave moving at this case, I think, at 40 kilometers per second. It's stuff to smack into a nice, innocent little cloud sitting there, roughly one solar mass, uh, of about a third of a parsec in size. And uh, you'll see what happens next. In fact, get the person to come up, and it's there. And so you're going to see two different colors. The, um, the density of the, of the target cloud is the orangish color, and the blue is going to be the shockwave material. So we want to look to see to what extent the shockwave material actually gets injected into the cloud. So there we go. You can see rather quickly 
Uh, the shockwave material, uh, you can see some stuff sort of turning green. That's kind of meaning it's kind of merging between the blue and the orange, which means it's going inside. With this 3D rendering, of course, you can't quite uh, see things as beautifully as you do in the 2D cuts. Uh, we're seeing the, the Rayleigh Taylor fingers, but if you uh, look at the, um, if you look close in, you can see some grainy, grainy stuff, which is not well resolved. But uh, but you can see that there, there are indeed really Taylor fingers forming in the in the 3D calculation, just as happens in, in 2D. So we've been continuing to do these calculations in 3D, uh, and, and uh, keeping using up a lot of uh, cluster time, uh, especially on the flash cluster, which we uh, were able to purchase through Carnegie Money. And again, thanks to Carnegie Institution for providing the cluster for me. We named it Flash because we're running the Flash code on it, so it seems entirely appropriate. Flash cluster is still busy working right now. I checked to make sure the queue was full this morning. It's still running. It never sleeps, hopefully. Okay, so uh, here's some more calculations that Sandy and I published a couple years back. But back to the cross sections. These are for non-rotating clouds uh, with a 40 kilometer per second shock. And what I'm highlighting now is letting you see in the 3D calculation, we, we actually can resolve, even in 3D, where you've got at least a, a, you know, a whole other power of, of grid points to take care of. You can see the, uh, the Rayleigh Taylor fingers in the upper left and the shock wave is just, was just forming. On the right hand side is a cross section through sort of the mid plane as it were of that shock front, showing you the distribution of the material which came from the shock front. So that's that's representing the short light rate activities, room 26 as it, were, as it were. You notice it looks kind of lumpy. That's because each of those lumps is a Rayleigh Taylor finger cut through this way. So you're looking down the axis of Rayleigh Taylor fingers, each of those orange uh, and yellowish blobs are Rayleigh Taylor fingers. So there's like you know, 100 of them or so. A little bit farther in time on the lower left is uh, shows the cross section with a very dense protostellar core forming. Again, a cut through the uh, on the right hand side shows you that, and by the time you get to that phase, a lot of the Rayleigh Taylor fingers kind of sweep around and miss. But the ones that actually form the, the protostar, they're only like you know, five or six Rayleigh Taylor fingers are the ones that do the injection. But they are efficient, they do get a fair amount of material in. So uh, that's all non rotating clouds. Okay, but you know, remember we want rotation, otherwise, we're not going to get a disk. So we finally went, started putting rotation into the calculations as well. So here are two calculations with 40 kilometers per second shock, same as before, where on the left hand side it's rotating pretty much as fast as the cloud should rotate without for certain forming a binary star system. And on the right hand side when it's probably rotating slow enough that it uh, should definitely be able to form a single star. You can see through this cross section, yes indeed, whereas the previous non-rotating one you see no evidence for a disk around that uh, clump over here in the lower left. We now have nice big yellowish oranges disks forming around. An even larger one for the case where the rotation rate is a factor of 10 higher, as you would expect. But they're not quite perfect uh, Sophronian disks. They're, they're kind of wavy and lumpy, but you know they're, they are indeed spinning, as they should be. So that was a uh, 40 kilometers per second. Here's the same thing now, doing the cross section through the, uh, through the densest portion where the protostar is forming on the left-hand side, the, the red dot in the center. You can see actually, because this cloud is rotating so quickly, it's sort of in danger of uh, fragmenting, into a, fragmenting into a binary star system. It's kind of got these rather lumpy spiral arms, which will do a lot of mass transport, sort of on the hairy edge of being able to form a single star versus perhaps fragmenting. Right hand side again shows the where the 26 is, that's the, the color field that's tracing the shockwave material, and you can see there's a fair amount of it inside, or the, the color scale down below, the, the lightish, limeish green. That is just about the right amount of uh, iron 60 or room 26 you need to talk about the uh, measurements that, that Miriam was referring to earlier. Okay, uh, same thing now for the slightly slower rotating cloud. Now the disk that forms is more like a Sophronian disk. It's kind of more axisymmetric. Blue star in the center, honey material injected on the right hand side. So this is all working. It sort of looks like a, I keep thinking of the topography of, of a back arc volcano or something I see that. It looks like a whole another situation, but uh, not the same physics. Okay, uh, so uh, here's the same sort of calculation with a slightly slower shock, 20, 40, that's sort of our, our target range. Same sort of thing occurs, though this one really does seem with the higher rotation, like that might make a binary star system. There's a big lump off to the side, and so that may or may not be one that we particularly would want to think of as our solar system. How? Yep. I can't read those labels. What's the physics? Uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a scale, so this is on a scale of about uh, 500 AU, so it's a really large scale. 
So this is still very early in the class. We're not really quite down to Safronov's 30 AU uh, scale uh, disk. Um, but that would be a point I'll bring up later, but we still have a lot more to go. Sorry, other question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, does it make a difference what your rotation orientation is compared to with how the shock wave is coming in? You were about to see that next. The question is what about uh, why do we have the shock wave coming directly on the rotation axis here? Good question. The, we started out doing, again, these calculations in 2D first, and in 2D you have to have the rotation axis aligned with the symmetry axis, otherwise you can't do the calculation in 2D. But in 3D, of course, you can let them go in any direction. So that's what's coming up next. So next paper, 2015, perpendicular rotation. Here, again, 40 kilometers per second shock, two different rotation rates of a cloud, but now it's rotating on its side. And, in fact, there's the initial spin direction, but oddly enough, they still form disks, but the disks are not, you know, they're, you might think that they would be this way, but instead they're more this way. And the weird thing is, um, the higher rotation spin, if you use the right-hand rule for your sense of rotation, the one on the left is spinning this way, the one on the right is spinning the opposite way. So that's a little odd. What's going on there? Not perhaps what you might think. So this is kind of interesting because this is something I did, you know, certainly did not predict ahead of time it was going to happen. It has to be explained. And here are a couple other ones. This is these two were for 40 kilometers per second. Here is a 20 kilometers per second. And these again are again, you know, all rotation axis by the right hand rule up to the right hand side. They're again spinning more aligned with the shock direction, but they're also sort of in and out of the third direction. You know, the, the, Plus in the, pop, the plus uh, z direction, let's see, right hand rule plus z is this way, so this one's kind of spinning out and axis this way, the other one's spinning that way. So four different models, four different spin axes. Why is that? Okay, well, the point is that the spin comes not from the initial cloud, but from the shock one. So here's one looking at that very first one I showed you, that ended up spinning with a, with a positive direction in that sense. If you look at the plot of the velocity component in the z direction, which is the velocities going back and forth in and out of the plane, where blue is negative, so that stuff is moving that way, and yellowish is positive, so it's moving this way. You can see that on the shock front, uh, material is moving with a sense of you know, ending up with rotation aligned in this direction from the shock front, not from what's going on inside the cloud. And in fact, the collapsing cloud has now picked that up. It actually has on the, on the right-hand side. You can see that uh, this region here is, you know, spinning one way, and the other side is spinning this way. And you can see the material streaming back to where it came from, where it picked up that velocity. Looking at it in the mid-plane, where that guy again has formed this disk, and you can see now we're plotting on the right-hand side the component of velocity in the x direction, which is this direction. And so the blue is moving this way, as the arrow shows. The red is moving that way. So it's making, this is now a, a cut right along. Shock's coming on this way. There's a symmetry axis. So it's a cut in this plane. So this thing is indeed spinning uh, about the symmetry axis of the shock front. And the material with that velocity has come from the, uh, from the shock front through the RT fingers. And so the question is, so the point is that the shock front is moving really fast, 40 kilometers per second. And you only need of the order of a few kilometers per second to give you the spin to make the, the, protos, the, the protoplanetary disk. And so the shock front velocity actually could very well not only trigger the collapse, could actually take a, a cloud and give it its spin as well, which is not something I've anticipated. So that was kind of a fun outcome of these calculations. Um, yep. Yeah. Does that mean that a uh, solar system spin axis is pointing to the supernova around it that gave us our <laughs> <laughs> If we'd been there at that time, 4.568, Really, uh, you know, years ago, yes, that that'd be right. It would be a fun thing to see. So, yeah. But of course, we've long since the lost memory of where we were. We were. But could you see so, that in uh, young it, clusters, it, maybe? Just, just me. Could you see that in young clusters and the correlation between the spin orientation? Presumably, you could, but we don't have the ability to uh, like, like look at that lens twelve forty one cloud. I mean, yeah. those guys might very well be spinning in different directions, and so one could look at Tauri stars and try to infer that, but. Uh, you really, well, I guess, we need all lot to look at something like that and see if you could really pick something up. That would be a fun, fun project to do, but I, boy, I don't know if uh, it's possible. It's a combination of having a close, nearby star forming region where supernova triggering was thought to have occurred. I'm not sure there are very many places where that would be possible. Supernova triggering, I should not say by any means, is a common way of forming star formation. A lot of folks say it's, it's very rare. So I'm being a little bit of a heretic by it, as usual. 
by uh, investigating this mechanism in such detail. Just to make sure that we still get a trigger, an injection occurring, here's that same uh, rotate, now rotating disc and the color field on the right hand side showing that the short line reactivity is going to inject it as well uh, with the arc really the other fingers. Okay. So, have we finished? Have we given everything that George Weller and Victor Sofronoff wanted? Well, not really, because if you look back here, um, the label on this uh, maximum density is 10 to the minus 11 grams per cubic centimeter, which you can't read. Uh, that's only 11 mag, orders of magnitude away from where we want to be in terms of <laughs> protostar. So we're still not quite there yet. Uh, so what uh, what uh, Sandy and I have been doing is uh, trying to uh, put in something called a sink cell, for example. Back, back in 1982, I did the first calculation where one put in what I call a sink cell to try to take care of what's happening with the unresolved protostar while you study what's happening in the outer region. Doing the same sort of thing here in the flash code, the sink cell is called a sink particle because it can move. And so what happens here is you've seen the entire computational volume after the shock wave is collapsed down smash this cloud, it's formed a dense rotating uh, protoplanetary disk, and somewhere right around here is where the, uh, where the disk uh, became dense enough that I say, hey, you're so dense I can't resolve what's happening and I'm going to replace you with a sink particle. So what you're seeing on the right hand side is a sink particle where it was formed and as it went down and still is aligned, it's in the center of the disk where it better be. Uh, but that's sort of the state of the art of the calculations right now, is trying to um, use some more physical tricks to take them farther along to where uh, Victor Sofronoff and George Weller would be happy. Here's a blow up on uh, that uh, sink particle disk which is being formed and uh, on the right hand side again uh, is the color field making sure that uh, you do indeed still get injection around the sink particle. Okay, now uh, what we really want to do though of course is make sure that we can get the right amount of material injected in. Uh, Wolf ray A stars, uh, you know, I told you uh, they inject, inject a lot of lumen 26, so they can pollute the interstellar medium, but you might not really want to use a Wolf ray A wind to try to trigger collapse because the models we've done show that Wolf ray A winds tend to be so diffuse, hot, and high velocity that they will shred clouds rather than trigger collapse. So you don't really want to do it with Wolf ray A wind simply. But even with a supernova, since so supernova starts off moving so quickly, you want it to slow down and sweep up a lot of material. And that means you have to, you're diluting the material from the supernova. It's not pure supernova. You're also sweeping up a lot of interstellar material along the way. And so um, in order to slow down the shock from tens of, uh, you know, several thousand kilometers per second to say 25, you can figure out you've got to dilute material by, by a factor of 100 or so. So when you do the math, I'm not going to go through the, the math here, but uh, you keep track of the amount of color <coughs> field that gets injected into the cloud. And you assume that you're you're losing, uh, you're diluting things by about a factor of 100 or so, and do the calculation. You come up with a dilution factor, super super uh, derived material of something like this big D value of three times 10 to the minus four. And other folks have done their estimates on depending on what supernova you look at, and they claim the number should be something like uh, between one times 10 to the minus four and two times 10 to the minus three. So we're sort of in the ballpark where we should be. But remember back to that image of the, of the uh, supernova remnant, the, the uh, Cassay supernova remnant, how lumpy things are coming out. So if you agree within a factor of four, that's about maybe the best we can ever agree for any individual isotope. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. However, there are other ways that uh, perhaps injecting material. What I've been talking about is wholesale injection of gas and dust, everything from the shockwave into the target cloud. Uh, the idea has also been tossed around by uh, Steve Desch and his uh, graduate student, Nicolette, about, well, maybe you can just uh, inject material into the already formed solar nebula. So you start off with a Sofronoff Weatherall solar nebula, and then the supernova goes off and, sh and shocks it and injects material in. So here's one of their calculations. What they found was um, that the, uh, because the solar nebula is sitting there, it's really very dense and massive compared to this rather ethereal shock wave. The shockwave gas comes and basically bounces off and flows off to the side. As you can see from the velocity vectors, it, it flows to the side, you know, deforms the outer disk a little bit, but the gas cannot get in. But if you have particles in there, if they're big enough particles, it's like buckshot. You fire a buckshot into it, particles can get injected. And so they found that uh, if you got uh, big enough particles, uh, here's their result. Uh, if you got up to um, 
larger than a tenth of a micron, in particular one micron or ten microns, you could get a fair amount injected. So the, the, uh, the gray area in the bottom is what fraction of the material got injected as individual particles and how much how many of the particles uh, got vaporized as they hit the shock wave through the, you know, the buckshot was being, um, that's frictional heating inside the, the uh, uh, surface layers of the disc. So some of it gets in it through vapor. It could get injection as long as you're larger than a tenth of a micron in size. And well, we know from our colleagues' work, which I skipped over here, that uh, if you look at using very careful studies with nanosims, that in, there indeed are some really uh, isotope-rich grains which are of, of order a tenth of a micron in size. Uh, Larry and, and Connell put a lot of effort in finding these things, and so we know that the big, fairly big grains do exist. And so that would uh, that sort of falls into this uh, bin here that you could get, you know, maybe 20, 40 percent injection. Maybe that's enough to to uh, bring in the short life reactivities that way. However, there's a conflict there that uh, presumably the, the grains that we can see in our meteorite samples are selected in the sense to be big because the biggest ones are the easiest ones to find. And the folks who study supernova remnants, uh, this paper just came out this year uh, analyzing a lot of uh, supernova remnant data. And they basically show that if you want to fit the spectral energy distribution of a supernova remnant, you need a population of grains which are less than a hundredth of a micron in size. It's sort of a power law, but if power law goes even smaller sizes and then peaks up at a hundredth of a micron and drops off. So they don't really need anything big to explain uh, you know, the bulk of the material that's pr uh, producing the, uh, the reddening in, in, in supernova remnants. And of course, that means that you're basically in this box here where there's nothing. So there's, uh, I, I, uh, so to the extent that grains are large, uh, those grains could still, in the context that I'm talking about, we're trying to get even smaller grains injected, and the larger ones will certainly get injected. Uh, the, the buckshot can only add to the dilution so I can only add to the enrichment that would uh, occur in the calculations that I'm talking about. But even, uh, but even with, uh, with the rather smallest physically indicated grain sizes, I think the scenario works perfectly fine even without injection into the solar anyway. So I think we're still alive there. One other possibility is, of course, HEB stars can also form Moon 26 and Iron 60. That's again something that, that Sandy and I have worked on. Uh, AGB planetary nebulas uh, are winds which are rather slow. That got the nice, nice speed, 20 kilometers per second, but they're kind of big, boozy, thick shocks that don't work very well. They kind of hit the cloud and, and they're not really uh, intense enough to drive their R. Rayleigh Taylor fingers. And so, in reality, AGB stars probably do not work, which is fine because AGB stars are even rarer in regions of star formation supernova are. So, that's something that folks have complained about for that scenario, that AGB star is probably not the source, and our, our work is consistent with that. Okay, so here are the conclusions. Uh, thanks to Miriam. Miriam's update, we're still alive on Iron 60. That's good, otherwise, like I said, I would have had to sit down. Uh, astronomical evidence is still pretty strong. Uh, we're continuing to do calculations on the flash cluster right now, not only uh, doing the uh, sink particles, but also trying to put in more of the detailed rate of transfer and heating and cooling processes that occur when you get to very high densities and you approach the protostellar phase. Uh, but basically, I think uh, I pretty much uh, answered some of the questions about how we could end up with something like the Sofronov weatherall uh, protostellar disk. Uh, even if you, and the amazing thing is, as hinted here, that even if you didn't have the, the disk pre solar club rotating in the right direction, by golly, the supernova shock wave will straighten you out and inject you and make you rotate the right way. So. At that point, I will close with one more gorgeous picture of a region of massive star formation, 30 Doradus, which is in a nearby large non cloud. And I will take some questions. So thank you. <laughs> Alicia. So if you look at Karina or Orion and you try to estimate what fraction of the stars would be close enough to one of the OB stars that when it went supernova, it would get the right speed and distance to get substantial enrichment. What fraction of the forming stars do you get to be like the solar nebula? Great question. I have no idea what the number is. <laughs> I really don't know. Uh, what you mostly see in regions like that is um, like the so sort of the pillars of God and the magic mountain from Karina that I showed before, those are all being hit by UV radiation and H2, they're basically H2 regions, which is a whole other way of driving collapse, although you don't necessarily have the pseudonym injection. So I don't know that I 
have seen any way to constrain it directly. It would be nice to know that number, but certainly... I think you could estimate the number of protostars within five parsecs of the O and B stars in Orion, and then yeah, the yeah. fraction of the total, right? It's not... I, my intuition is it's not going to be huge, right? It's I, be I agree, yeah. That, uh, that's what I'm saying. Again, this is sort of a her heretical scenario. I mean, whenever I fire these papers off to get reviewed, I've been reviewed a lot of times because I've written a lot of papers. One of the things they often complain about is, you know, is this is really, are you crazy or what? I say, no, I'm not crazy. I work for Carnegie. I do what I want to do. <laughs> so, um, but you're right. I'd love to know the answer to that, but I, I, I don't think it's it's very common. And so some people object to that because they say, well, does that mean that we're special, the solar nebula? You know, because some, and there are no, there's a whole other set of people who like the polluting of the interstellar medium because then if everybody's got lumen 26, everyone's got iron 60, then we're not special at all. Whereas if the iron 60 really is high and if these calculations are right, then we are kind of special. So some folks don't like the, you know, the, the people-centric universe and, and some people say, well, you know, hey, if this is the evidence we have, uh, it really does seem to point to that sort of origin, we have to accept that, assuming that all the little bits and pieces of the puzzle are, are concrete. Hey. Well, as a dear colleague, I always associate with you with the giant planet formations because you knew so much, and then a little bit about their shock <laughs> research. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it's very interesting because I'm doing, you know, uh, doing some experiment. We can get to uh, shock speed uh, uh, up to 45 kilometers per second at the near national land now, and uh, we just start doing some of this. But we're in very different density regions. So what I want to understand is what. Your, uh, your density limitations and what kind of those calculations do you come out with the temperature? Uh. <coughs> sorry, so, so the question was, there's some, there's some people online who want me to try to repeat the questions. And I, uh, sorry, I didn't do it for Alicia's question, but the uh, question from Faye is about what sorts of, uh, given that uh, folks like Sandia can do, uh, and the National Mission Facility can do some wonderful shockwave experiments, what, uh, where they're trying to investigate the equation of state of metallic hydrogen, for example, things like the importance for the interiors of the giant planets. How far away are their conditions, which are basically like, you know, one gram per cubic centimeter, and you know, what, uh, well, well, I guess compre it's compressing, starting off at rather low densities, but then getting to the very high temperatures. We're talking about here, as far as I was able to go, remember, it's like 10 to the minus 11 grams per cubic centimeter, and as Rick will often say, that's better than the vacuum you guys can pull in the lab, right? So that's not exactly what you guys would call dense. And the temperature is starting off at uh, the dense colonic cloud core, core, cloud core is maybe 10 kilometers, uh, sorry, 10 Kelvin. The shockwave heating heats up to a more order of 1,000 uh, degrees Kelvin, and at that point, uh, molecular uh, species inside, water vapor in particular, cools it, keeps it at around 1,000 or so. Unless it gets a really high speed, it can get even to more like a, a 10,000 degrees Kelvin. But so it's not quite a plasma. Not, at least not everything is ionized. But it's uh, it's more like on the order of 1,000 degrees Kelvin. And uh, of course, on the way to protostar densities, it eventually gets up to around uh, 2,000 degrees Kelvin. And then molecular hydrogen can dissociate and drive the second collapse, which takes the protostar all the way up to the uh, density, central densities of uh, one gram per cubic centimeter, and central temperatures of 100,000 or so. But that, so that's the goal is to be able to go that far. But I've been working on this for what 30 years. I'm only up to 10 minus 11 grams per cubic centimeter. So uh, I am getting older. I'm not quite sure if I'll make it, but we're uh, still trying. John Chambers. Yeah. So a lot of the new models for planet formation favor disks, which are several hundred AU in size, as your starting point. Um, is that likely to be an outcome of something that's hit with one of these uh, shock waves, or would you expect the final disk quite a bit smaller than that? So the question is, how big uh, of a disk do one expect to get from a shock wave-driven uh, collapse? Uh, because some a lot, a lot of theoreticians these days are considering rather large uh, disk models in their theories. And in fact, you know, of course, the Alma disk, the one we have a huge amount of information for, is 180 in size. Well, I didn't quite. I should have emphasized, you know, like. Larry said he couldn't quite read the labels, but those disks you were seeing there were sort of 500 AU across. So uh, even the slowly rotating cloud, when it was on its side, the shock wave itself was enough to give it a you know several hundred AU diameter disk. So yeah, it's making big disks whether you want them or not. Of course, it's still early in the collapse phase, so they they, they will eventually contract down. But they also have a lot of angular momentum, so you've got to. You don't, can only contract if you get rid of the angular momentum somehow. So there's a lot more messy physics involved in this. It's just, again, just sort of 
a sketch of how you might have formed the solar nebula at an early phase of its formation. Yes, Miriam. So you mentioned a couple times that iron 6C is critical, but I thought that even without iron 6C, the aluminum 26 abundance would require supernova. Is that not correct? Well, I, I think that depends on who you talk to. I think, you know, Glenn McPherson, who likes... So, so the question, sorry, the question was, is Iron 60 the main motivation for pursuing the supernova triggering, or uh, is Aluminum 26 alone? Uh, Glenn McPherson, I think, would say Aluminum 26 alone, uh, you know, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 5 is probably enough. Uh, the, the reason that was first doubted was because of Frank Hughes who were claiming that you would make Aluminum 26 by spallation reactions in this x win model to make room 26 locally. So that's kind of, that was the beginning of people saying, oh, well, maybe you don't need this. And then when Iron 60, Tachibana came up, then even Frank Hsu said, well, yeah, um, that's more of a smoking gun that you really cannot make that one in appreciable amounts by spallation reactions. So he sort of backed off at that point. But then other folks like Ed Young come along with their, he's been doing very serious modelings of galactic uh, chemical evolution. And he says, well, you know, this stuff is all over the place. You know, other folks, Matthew, Matthew Gunnell, have advanced this that is just polluting everything, and so why would you not expect to see it? So we're really kind of down in the, in the details of, uh, to really rule this in or rule this out, it, I hate to say it, but it you know, falls in the lap of, of folks like you to tell us to the best we can what that initial value is, because that, that's going to be the one key element that, uh, that cannot be uh, overcome by uh, other fudging of the theoretical models, at least if they're not in my opinion. Yes, question. Uh, recently. Oh, Morris. Yeah, Morris Eisenman, sorry. <laughs> uh, I've seen a quote for the age of the solar system as four significant digits, which are easy to remember 4.567 billion years. The quote comes from the Scientific American article last month, the December issue. Yep, yep. Some, uh, I can't remember from that. Not arguing about how accurate those four digits are. How long between whatever is given as the official age of the solar system and the impact of a supernova, according to your calculations, is there? I'm just trying to get a sense of time. Uh, between, and of course, that's a function of distance of where the supernova is, but do you have any sense of that given the Half-life of aluminum of the iron. I'm just trying to get a so, sense so, of the timing. So, it, it, in, in basic terms, it's one million years is sort of still the magic number, uh, including because uh, that also figures into those dilution estimates I talked about. You have to not only start with when they were freshly synthesized and supernova exploded. That's sort of the beginning of the race. So the stuff is coming out and it's dying away at the same time, like that titanium 44 is. It's amazing we still see it because it's half-life at 60 years, and so yeah, you, you've got a race where it's, everything's dying out, and the shockwave's slowing down, and yet you've got these guys locked up in the CAIs, and they're there at some level, and so you try to match that dropping abundance and the dilution, and peg it, and it's basically you know, one million years is still within factors of two, I would say, the best bet between four point. Uh, there's the there's a the number there on the on the bottom four point five six seven point seven two. So there's five significant figures. A little bit of plus or minus on it, but uh, yeah, there's your 4.568. So what is, just follow up, what is the definition of the beginning of the solar system? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's it right there. Okay. <laughs> I'd say, you know, I mean, astronomers, needless to say, they, they when they look at T-Tori stars, they estimate and say, well, here's something which is maybe 100,000 years old, or this is maybe a billion, or this is a... I mean, there, there are different, there's class 0, 1, 2, 3 T Tauri stars. And the earlier cores, I think, are often referred to, uh, there's a first core that I call the class minus 1 object because it doesn't really fit in the classification scheme. And, and a pre collapsed cloud, I would call a class minus 2. So, But usually folks think of when you get to a protostellar density, an actual so called second core forms. That's, to my mind, is T equals 0. Um, but it's very really hard to. Uh, it's based on theoretical models. We all know the problem with theoretical models of predicting exactly the time scales and the evolution. Uh, there, there's a certain uh, fuzziness there, I would say. Uh, Alicia, is that a, a fair assessment? But you know, so I'd say that within 100, plus or minus 100,000 years, people can, can age date young stars, roughly. 
for that number you're saying is the age of these objects and the oldest things in the country. The sun could have formed a couple hundred thousand years before that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And just to just to confuse things more, there are some refractory inclusions that don't seem to have any radioactivities like this at all. Yet they're sitting there, the so-called fun inclusions. And so that's a bit of a puzzle. Do they somehow come in before the shockwave material formed and formed? The suggested. Uh, at least in my models, everything that's coming in is already it's already enriched. So I, I'd like to see a little tiny little area that doesn't have any moon six in it. I can say, ah, that's where the funds are made, but I haven't seen that yet. That's a challenge for the future. Maybe there's some other explanation. I don't know. Oh, but I, I think those inclusions are an argument for this kind of, of, of scenario. That this evidence that there are things with these nuclear effects but no aluminum 26. Yes. I think is an argument that you did not have a lot of aluminum 26 already in the cloud. That you have to bring it in during the process. Okay. No, I, uh, My personal life. Search. So uh, several observers nowadays are doing very detailed chemical analysis of uh, stellar photospheres, uh, not to the isotope level that you're talking about, but could the supernova actually cause some large bulk change in, in metallicity or perhaps particular elements that we could observe from the ground with uh, spectroscopy? Yeah. Okay. So the question was, can we use stellar abundances to say something about the supernova? Uh, that'd be great if we could. I mean, the short life reactivities are, are the main way of getting a handle on that. But remember, the supernova shockwave has to sweep up 100 times more stuff along the way in. So its contribution is 1% of all the other junk it picked up. So the short live stand out because the stuff it swept up is probably old enough that short live have died. So those are still evidence. But all the other, just you know, clear out a table. It's diluted by a factor of 100, so I, I'd be amazed if we found something really exotic that would stand. It's so short line, I think, are the, are the key to understanding that. Jonathan, I have a question. So what would your models of supernova injection suggest about the uh, distribution of things like aluminum 26 in the, uh, solar, in the solar nebula? Would it be homogeneous or heterogeneous, or on sort of what scale would that vary? Okay, so the question is, if you have supernova injection, what does that mean for heterogeneity and homogeneity of the short lives in the, in the disk? Uh, well, as you can see from the calculations, the sort of color field was you know, looking pretty homogeneous, but we're still pretty far away from having formed the disk. Um, but my feeling is that, uh, which is a whole other talk, I have a whole other hat I wear, which is you know, skipping head of the Safronov Nebula watching transport mixing in the disk. I've done numerous calculations where I have injected material as if a Rayleigh Taylor finger just hit the disk. So, uh, sort of like in the Dash and Roulette model. And I've shown that uh, even if you put in, you know, basically take, take a rotating disk which is um, gravitationally unstable, and you take a, a little needle of, of dye and drop it in on the disk surface, within a few hundred years, it's everywhere. And it gets homogenized to within Depending on uh, where you drop in the time scales, it can get homogenized to within, say, 10%, certainly within 100 years, and even more if you wait a little bit longer. So the feeling is from the, this whole, whole other set of models, which I'm not talking about today, is that even if you start off with heterogene heterogeneity through something as extreme as a Rayleigh Taylor finger hitting you right smack there, a lot of the material will get will flow into the form of the protostar, but the stuff that's behind gets transported <coughs> inwards and outwards and, and, and evens out, smooths out. So, I think heterogeneity at the level of you know one part in ten to the five, uh, you know, which you know, some you know sort of the per mil, the per epsilon units that meteorists use are yeah that stuff. Uh, you know, this is pretty a whole other order of magnitude from evening things out to one percent or ten percent. One percent, ten percent is certainly going to be even up to that much. Rick might have something to say about that's that. That's all you need for aluminum twenty six. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, if you get a, even a percent or a tenth of a percent, you're, you're great for lunar 26 age data, any other short lived one. So the fact that we can just discriminate nucleosynthetic anomalies at the PPM level is a whole other story. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think you described it well. Yeah. And that's, that's probably extinct rate, I mean, those are extinct rate yeah, that's that came along. Those are the stuff that got swept up on the way in. Yeah. Okay. No more questions. Uh, let's thank Alan again. He's around to answer questions. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah.